university, I think, is a kind of time of illumination, illumination with really big ideas. And for Newman, I think that that's, that's, that's true to say. He's really known as kind of one of the greatest prose writers, poetry writers, one of the greatest scholars of the 19th century. And so definitely that would have been formed here in his, his time in Oxford. And you, one of his most famous hymns, of course, is like, Lead Kindly Light. And I think there's a lovely connection here with his time in Oxford. The motto of the University of Oxford is Dominus Illuminatio Mea, the Lord is my light. And so certainly there's no greater kind of disciple of the light of truth, apostle of the light of truth, than John Henry Newman. All of the, the controversies, all of the discussions, all of the arguments in his life really geared towards the light who is a person, Christ Jesus. Newman's life here at Oxford was one of continually going after the light of truth wherever it would lead. And I think that he initially saw that as a, as a, as a reformation of sorts, a re-reformation of the Anglican Church. It had kind of fallen into an evangelical slant, had lost. He and others felt a kind of continuity with, with the past, with the kind of richness of what he called the primitive church, or the early church. To break away from Oxford was really like a piece of his heart being, being ripped out. It was not only saying goodbye to friends. When he converted, his, his sister never spoke to him again. And although he kept, tried to keep good contact with many of the, the, friends that, the friendships that he developed here, um, it was a real sadness. He was, uh, uh, people mocked him in the street. You know, he was, he was regularly abused. And religious questions were the central questions of, of English public life in the 19th century. So everyone knew of, of Newman's humiliation. He was looking to find out what he could do when he became a Catholic, after he converted. He hunted around. People had said, maybe you should start an oratory. It was that sense of living in community that he found most attractive about the idea of the oratory. We, we promise in charity to live alongside each other and learn how to make room for each other and always to have that sense of freedom in our giving of ourselves to each other in community. Newman found this immensely attractive. So for these reasons, um, he decided that it would be the oratory that he would, he would bring to England with the blessing of the Pope. And I am grateful for the opportunity that we have today to talk about soon to be Saint John Henry Newman, I mean, a man who had so much influence, not only upon my conversion, but countless others. The thing I want to emphasize is something that he himself emphasized very early in his career. He addressed the subject of the importance of personal influence in spreading the faith. Christianity spread primarily not as a system, not through books, not through arguments, not through temporal power, but primarily through personal influence. Teachers who not only taught the truth, but who embodied the truth of the good news as what he called a pattern of truth. He not only identified the principal cause of the spread of Christian faith, he then went on to embody that in his own conversion process. You know, you can find in his writings, what, 31 volumes, but you find his correspondence are 32 bulging books 21,000 letters. And these aren't just, you know, perfunctory. These are personal. And so you can see that he's not just a profound thinker. He's not just an eloquent preacher. He's not just a gifted writer. He had a gift of friendship. And it was through the apostolate of friendship, through all of these letters, through all of these years, that he ended up wielding an influence of love. God has created me to do him some definite service he has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know what it is in this life, but I shall be told it in the next. Maybe even in high school is when I first heard Father Bischel talk about him. I had a class on him all semester in major seminary, and um, I wish I remembered the details of everything, but I remember what I walked away with. Um, was like the life of a, of a person who in his time, in his own life, all you would have seen was you would have seen this really influential human being give up, give up his influence 
for the love of God and for the love of the church. You would have seen this person who was a failure and starting you know, a, a seminary that just kind of didn't succeed. Uh, you would have seen a person rejected uh, by many people who should have embraced him. You would have seen someone who I think in many ways lived an isolated and lonely life. Um, not of his own choosing, but just because of his circumstances. But you'd also see the life of someone who didn't let those things make him callous, and they didn't, he didn't allow those things to make him bitter, and he didn't allow those things, the faults of others or even of the church, to drive him away from others or from the church, but he kept his heart fresh and open because of how rooted he was in Jesus. So much so that years after, I think he is the most quoted recent theologian in the, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism, Catechism of the Catholic Church quotes him, I think, more than any modern day theologian, um, bar none. And you think his influence is massive at the time he seemed insignificant. And what that says to us and what we're called to do and how we're called to live is even if no one is paying any attention, even if everyone says that that's ridiculous, um, but if we're pursuing the Lord, then it's okay. I'm not, I'm not performing for an audience of the world. We're performing for an audience of one. And if I can, we, if any of us could, at the end of our lives, look at the Lord and say, like, I think I did what you asked me to do. I think I did that dis definitive service that you're asking me to do. Um, maybe the greatest gift any of us could receive is the greatest gift any of us could ever give God back. I found out I was pregnant in late April of 2013, and I started losing some blood in the pregnancy around May 1st. Uh, of course, I took that as a bad sign. So, of course, I went to my doctor, and my doctor did an ultrasound and found out that the placenta had become partially detached from the uterine wall, and it had become ripped. So there was a hole in it, and the hole in it was allowing blood to escape. The blood, of course, was supposed to remain in the placenta and nourish my child. But I had quite a, a tremendous amount of the pregnancy left. Gemma was due on January 1st, and it was only May. So I did wonder, how am I going to get through the rest of this pregnancy? So on Wednesday morning, on May 15th, I woke up. And when I woke up in bed, I was already laying in a pool of blood which was very scary because I was told to observe strict bed rest. And if I had already been sleeping, I thought, how much more still can I be? You know, I had lost any kind of influence over the bleeding. So what I need to do first is get the kids set up for breakfast and get them safe and eating. And then I need to manage the situation as best as I can. So the kids helped to get each other ready and they sat in their seats and I said to them, um, I need to go upstairs for a while. Please don't get out of your seats no matter what. Don't get up. I didn't want anyone to get hurt, but I also didn't want anyone to sneak up on me and see the bleeding, the trauma. I didn't want to scare them. I went in my bedroom and then I went into my bathroom and I closed both doors. I wanted to hear the door if they came upstairs so that they couldn't sneak up on me. And when I got to the bathroom, I was exhausted, and now the bleeding was even worse. So in this moment, I'm losing a ton of blood. I don't have my phone. I can't scream. My children aren't coming upstairs. I don't know how much more time I have, but I'm imagining I have very little time left to be bleeding at this rate. So just then I said, please, Cardinal Newman, make the bleeding stop. And it stopped immediately. It was flowing rapidly and it just came to a hard stop. And I stood up and I looked around and I said, Cardinal Newman, did you just make the bleeding stop? I mean, I knew he did, but that's what I said. And just then I smelled roses filled the bathroom air. And I inhaled and it was incredible. And I said, thank you, Cardinal Newman. Oh, wow, thank you. 
Gemma was supposed to be born, um, if at all, premature and small, but she was born eight and a half pounds at a very healthy weight. I'm so filled with joy and gratitude, and um, I can't believe that it's me, you know, after um, Cardinal Newman died in 1890, and here it is uh, nearly 130 years later, and I could be a part of this process. I'm reminded of something he wrote, you know, about um, God has created me to do some definite service, and I feel like I'm a link in the chain. It's just great for so many people to know that if an ordinary person like myself can be miraculously cured by such a, um, an, an intellectual powerhouse, and such a holy man, that nobody is off limits to ask for help in their lives. And the words thank you don't seem to be sufficient, but that's all I seem to be able to keep saying is thank you. <laughs> but I, I, I want to thank God and Cardinal Newman with all of my heart. At his funeral, the day of his funeral, the cortege went, co a coffin and horses, the six, seven miles from the oratory south to Rednall where he was buried in the Oratorian summer house in the graveyard there. And those miles of road were lined by the people of Birmingham. And uh, I think contemporary comments say that they'd come to salute somebody whom they knew as their father, as their father in God. And, and I think that tells uh, a great story about a crucial aspect of the life of Cardinal Newman. Thank you.